Good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> I really want to thank you all uh, for being here today. Uh, and I want to thank those who are going to be following us on uh, the live stream. Uh, it's clear from your participation that you're very committed to this school. And, that, and for that, I'm very, very grateful. Hard for me to fathom, but I've survived my first year as dean. <laughs> So this is uh, my first, and I hope not my last, state of the school address. <laughs> the last year, and last night, uh, preparing for this, uh, was exhausting. Uh, but it's also been uplifting and inspiring. I have truly been inspired by all of you. Uh, inspired by your constant striving for excellence, striving that I have witnessed every day in our classrooms, in our laboratories. I've been inspired by your dedication to public service, by your giving selflessly to others, a generosity of self that I've witnessed in our clinics, our offices, our kitchens. I've seen how Harvard Medical School transports its good services into our neighborhoods on the family van, into our schools through student volunteerism, and to all corners of the globe through our efforts in international public health. Yes, this work, your work, has lifted my spirits and inspired my confidence. Inspired my confidence to say the state of Harvard Medical School is sound. This past year has shown me what a privilege it is to be a member of this community and what a daunting responsibility it is to be leading this extraordinary institution into a new era of achievement. I've spent the last year immersing myself in all things Harvard Medical School. I've spent it listening, weighing the various perspectives I've heard, and learning. I've incorporated a multitude of your ideas into the strategy and vision for the future of HMS that I will lay out today, a vision that we will be pursuing together in the coming years. Together is the operative word, because it's going to take all of us, every one of us, every one of you, working together as a community to deliver on the great promise of this great institution. I'd like to tell you a story I recently shared with our colleagues at Partners Healthcare about an experience I had when I was first on the wards as an intern at the MGH. For me, it was an epiphany of sorts and reflects why I believe it's so critical to maintain and nurture the special sense of community and collaboration we have here at HMS. So it was Christmas Eve of my internship year. I was assigned to the cardiac step-down unit on Ellison 10. I was the first crop of interns entrusted with the responsibility to manage what was our busiest service. I took 14 hits that night, 14 admissions. That was a record for my internship year. All around me, all night, monitors were beeping, alarms were sounding, and there were three codes, three cardiac arrests. I was frazzled. I was terrified. I got no sleep that night, but I survived, as did those patients. And on rounds the next morning, I had a profound realization. I realized that there were only a small number of ways a patient could die while on my watch. <laughs> it was uh, lack of oxygen, lack of blood pressure, lack of a heartbeat. And I had proven to myself that I was capable of managing each one of these life-threatening clinical scenarios. Uh, those of you who are doctors, you'll realize uh, it was a transformative, exhilarating moment. I learned that as long as I could handle the challenges 
of acute critical care medicine, I could relax, I could be thoughtful about systematically securing a diagnosis, formulating a therapeutic plan. From that day forward, I was a better doctor. Now, more importantly, I realized that even though I was on call by myself, I was not alone that night. That night, I was supported by a host of remarkable colleagues, other residents, nurses, x-ray technicians, respiratory technicians. I think there was even an attending physician on call. <laughs> I think. But I didn't have to shoulder all the responsibility because I was part of a team. I learned that those colleagues had my back as I had theirs, and that night, we worked collectively to serve those patients and keep them safe and alive. Now, I could make similar analogies about the importance of teamwork and collegiality in my laboratory research, although perhaps not with the same drama as that night on the cardiac step-down unit. But no doubt, biomedical research is increasingly a multidisciplinary, highly coordinated, collaborative science that requires colleagues to come together to advance the most creative and impactful science. Now, over the past year, I have spoken extensively about the importance of community here at Harvard Medical School. After my very first frazzled year as dean, I feel like I have finally settled into a place where I know enough about the role that I can start to reflect and plot a strategic path forward because I can depend on my team and all of you to share responsibility to deliver on our mission, which is to create and nurture a diverse community dedicated to alleviating human suffering caused by disease. You, every single member of this community, should take pride in the fact that you are integral to the success of this mission. The work that you do offers hope to the world. Your efforts contribute to the improvement of human health around the globe through the discovery of new medicines and technologies. Your contributions are changing human health. Now, over the past year, I've learned some remarkable truths about you and this entire community. I've learned that you are performing at an incredibly high level. Indeed, it's the high performance of individuals like you in the aggregate that makes HMS the place that people want to come. They want to come to be a student, to teach, to conduct research, to care for patients, to work. I've learned that what we all have in common is the earnest and shared desire to advance the frontiers of knowledge and to make the world a better place. But we must and we will confront challenges. During the past year, I, I learned about this extraordinary institution by listening. Listening in many settings, town halls, faculty meetings, Green Dragon pubs. <laughs> we have one this afternoon. I'll be doing more listening. From these experiences, I've come away with an even greater reverence for the people who make up the Harvard Medical School community. I thank you for your service, especially our quad faculty, who are so passionately committed to advancing the frontiers of fundamental scientific inquiry, as well as healthcare policy and global health. You offer unique expertise and a razor-sharp focus on fundamental mechanisms and brilliant insights into the biological world, from the atomic to the cellular, to the organismal, to the population, and indeed, on a global scale. And this puts you in the vanguard of mechanism-driven biology and at the cutting edge of policy and global health. And I thank you for your service. An increasing percentage of HMS scientific research laboratories are now based at the affiliates. Our hospital-based scientific faculty explore the fundamental tenets of disease, they're relentless in advancing our mission to eradicate disease, and they end up training more than half of our graduate students. And I am grateful for your service. The largest percentage by far 
of the enormous HMS faculty constitute the clinical investigators, practitioners, and teachers at our 15 affiliates. They go beyond, above and beyond, to advance clinical research, provide exceptional patient care, and they play an outsized role in educating our medical students. We are indebted to you for your extraordinary service. Our students and trainees who come to us wanting to make a powerful difference, to improve lives and change the world for the better, you represent the best that our country has to offer science and medicine. You, our students and trainees, are the future. You are the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you for what you bring to our community and for what you will give back in service to others in the future. And finally, our administrators and staff, you work energetically to support our collective mission of advancing research, education, and patient care. You are the engine. HMS would not be the institution that it is without your tremendous efforts. When I took this position, it became immediately clear to me that our faculty and students were supported by individuals who could work anywhere they want but choose to serve our community. I hope, because you embrace our mission, and you take pride in what we do collectively. I'm thrilled that we have such an exceptional administration and staff. And I am thrilled that Lisa Muto, our Executive Dean for Administration, is my proven, strong, and wise partner. I am also enormously grateful for the service of Willie Lynch. <laughs> Hi, Willie. <laughs> Willie uh, has been at my side as chief of staff. Many of you have come to know Willie, come to understand his fierce loyalty to our school. Our community is strong in part because we ask so much of all of you. And each of you responds with dedication to task, respect for colleagues, and active participation in serving the goals and mission of Harvard Medical School. In return, our community endeavors to provide an environment where each and every one of you is respected, nurtured, and given a safe and supportive workplace. Harvard Medical School is strong only when each individual can rise to his or her fullest potential. My first act as dean was to convene a special task force of individuals throughout HMS to explore diversity and inclusion across our community. Led by Joan Reed, the task force has been working steadily, initially to define our values and articulate our highest aspirations, and more recently to take stock of where we stand in applying and living those values and where we need to go to meet the high expectations we set for ourselves. To celebrate our community and its diversity, I want to share a brief video with you that reflects on our strengths. A diverse community is more creative, more brilliant, and basically more fun. Diversity is important for a number of reasons. First of all, it's important for the interactions that we have with each other that we can learn and grow and understand different people's views and cultures. When I'm meeting with people who come from very different backgrounds, different experiences, different cultures, then I always come away enriched and I seek out those opportunities because it makes me a better person. I can contribute more through a more inclusive process. It's so crucial for us to be in a diverse community because I think that's really the only way we're going to learn how to treat patients. This is the most diverse community that I've ever been a part of, and I think I'm speaking about like the 160-something people that are in my medical school class. So HMS is very successful at advancing diversity at the student level. It's awesome. At the educational level, it's becoming awesome. And as of today, it seems like the whole school is moving in that direction. 
I think one of the most important things for advancing diversity and inclusion at HMS is just having conversations and meeting people who are different from you. I look around the room and I look around the spaces and I look at my colleagues and I see people from all over the world, from so many different cultures, from so many different experiences. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for mentors and teachers working with me and investing in me and saying, you know, you can do it, you can succeed, you can be at a place like Harvard Medical School. Both the, the medical school and the affiliated hospitals have been tremendous in supporting my interests and supporting my way of thinking, and I see that clearly among all of my peers as well. I'm always amazed at how quickly HMS comes out and takes a position around diversity and inclusion whenever there are issues that really impact their students, their faculty, their staff. I find that Harvard has a lot to do in terms of diversity and initiatives, but they've been very open about setting up times to hear our voices and make sure that the school is really reflective of what the students want. I really value having those uh, diverse voices really be represented here at Harvard Medical School. I'm deeply committed to cultivating an environment that promotes inclusive excellence throughout our HMS community. Diverse teams are better able to address health disparities in populations around the world. Multiple perspectives are best at solving complex challenges in biomedical science. We are better together. I have to say I'm really proud to be a member of this Harvard Medical School community. Thank you so much. There's so much to take pride in at uh, Harvard Medical School. In the last year alone, our community, faculty, students, staff, have been recognized across an astonishing spectrum of achievement. You've been recognized for your contributions to innovative research that's at the frontiers of science and technology, whether basic or translational. You've been recognized for, for providing the most compassionate and exceptional patient care and you've been recognized for mentorship and teaching. As dean, I get notified about virtually every one of these accolades that's bestowed upon you. I get notices virtually every day, and when I look at the list, I'm in awe of the extraordinary achievements that are recognized by these awards. The video that uh, we're gonna show lists a fair number of these, but far too many for me to recognize here individually. And as we consider these many prestigious honors, I want to call particular attention to just a few of the extraordinary individuals in our community. Steve Elledge, the Gregor Mendel Professor of Genetics and of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital for receiving the prestigious 2017 Breakthrough Prize. Candace Yip, PhD candidate in genetics for receiving the 2017 Harold M. Weintraub Graduate Student Award. Denise Brown in Student Affairs, for receiving the 2017 Dean's Community Service Award. Andrew Cruz, Assistant Professor of Biological Chemistry, Molecular Pharmacology, for earning his first NIH R01. <laughs> Barbara McNeil, Barbara, Chair of Healthcare Policy, who won the prestigious Wallace McDermott Medal from the National Academy of Medicine. Joan Reed, Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership, and Professor of Medicine, for receiving the Commitment to Diversity Award from Exconomy. Molly Schumer, Research Fellow in Genetics, for receiving the L'Oreal USA 2017 Women in Science Fellowship. Nancy Tarbell, Dean for Academic and Clinical Affairs, and the C.C. Wang Professor of Radiation Oncology at MGH, for receiving the Marie Skladowska Curry Award from the American Association for Women Radiologists. David Reich, Professor of Genetics, co-recipient of the Dan David Prize for being the world's leading pioneer in analyzing ancient human DNA and for his computational discovery of intermixing between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, which was called a step change in human evolution studies, gives me insight into my own personality. <laughs> 
Miles Brown, Pam Silver, Alan Garber, three faculty who were elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, David Ginty, Barbara Kahn, Rachel Wilson, and Junying Yuan, four faculty who were elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Steve, uh, Scott Armstrong, Mark Daly, Alan DeAndrea, Michael Greenberg, and Scott Pomeroy, faculty who were elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Arlene Sharp, Gordon Freeman, who received the Warren Alpert Foundation Prize for their transformative discoveries in the field of cancer immunology. Paul Farmer, who was honored with the 2017 McLean Center Prize in Clinical Medical Ethics and was recently named by the National Academy of Sciences to receive its 2018 Public Welfare Medal, given annually to honor the extraordinary use of science for the public good. I think you'll agree with me, this is an astounding array of achievement. And really, those we have called out here only begin to il illustrate the many accomplishments that take place here every day. I also want to take a moment and pay tribute to some extraordinary HMS faculty and friends who we lost this past year. I want to pay particular tribute to Walter Goralnik, who passed away last fall at the age of 100 after devoting more than 70 years of his life to Harvard. Under Dr. Goralnik's leadership as professor and chair of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, the Faculty of Medicine approved the Harvard Mass General two-degree oral and maxillofacial surgery residency program, which has been a model for such surgical training throughout the United States. Dr. Goralnik helped found Delta Dental of Massachusetts, one of the first dental insurance plans in the nation. He was a true leader in the field. Shirley Driscoll, Emeritus Professor of Pathology, only our sixth female professor ever, died two weeks ago at age 95. Dr. Driscoll was the first faculty chair of the Joint Committee on the Status of Women at a time when greater than 90% of the voting faculty were men. Dr. Driscoll made pioneering contributions to our understanding of the pathology of infants, of diabetic mothers, to concepts of fetal disease, inherited disorder, and mechanisms of transplacental disease. We also lost Ann Fetterman last year. As a physician and educator, beloved mentor to so many in this community, his contributions will continue to be felt at HMS for generations. Dr. Fetterman was a groundbreaking endocrinologist. He dedicated 63 years to Harvard Medical School as a faculty member, as dean for students and alumni, and as dean for medical education, where he was a leader in implementing the new pathway curriculum, which became a model of student-centered medical instruction that transformed the learning experience here at HMS, but really at many schools around the world. Dr. Fetterman was one of the titans of Harvard and American medicine, and he will be sorely missed. Along with our faculty, I want to especially recognize that we lost two of our most valued advisors and members of our Board of Fellows in the past year, Herb Kaplan of the Warren Alpert Foundation and the biotechnology leader, Henry Termier. We will miss all of these extraordinary members of our community. They have our unqualified gratitude for the legacy that they leave. As dean, I feel a tremendous responsibility to uphold that legacy and to advance the preeminence of Harvard Medical School. I believe it's clear where we need to go. To quote a notable philosopher, the great one, Wayne Gretzky, <laughs> we need to skate to where the puck is going to be. The speed with which biomedical knowledge is accruing has accelerated the fastest rate humanity has ever seen. And now it extends far beyond the capacity of the human mind to comprehend. Consequently, the biomedical research enterprise is becoming increasingly dependent upon computational, quantitative, and systems approaches, and machine learning to make sense of the mountains of clinical information that we're gathering. Together, we must invest to be at the forefront of these trends. My predecessor, Jeff Flyer, 
showed remarkable prescience in establishing the Department of Biomedical Informatics. And Mark Kirshner was visionary in founding the Department of Systems Biology. I plan to invest considerable resources to strengthen both of these departments because I see them providing an increasingly critical foundation for the biological inquiry that will dominate in the years ahead, not only at the Quad, but across the entire biomedical ecosystem. I don't know if Mark is here. Is he here today? He is not here today. But I do want to take a moment to give special recognition to Mark for his many years of service to HMS, initially as chair of cell biology, and then as such an insightful leader of systems. Mark will be, has, has announced his intention to step down as chair. Um, and he is clearly one of the leading scientific lights in our community. He is someone whose counsel I deeply respect. He's been extremely generous to me. He's lent me his wisdom, while also, I should add, maintaining his inimitable ability to, how should I say, provide constructive feedback. <laughs> so if Mark were here, we'd give him a round of applause. Be Becky, please extend our... They broke the mold. <laughs> um, given that our mission statement says that we aspire to alleviate human suffering caused by disease, I want to apply HMS resources in creative new ways so that our community will be more effective at delivering solutions to the major biomedical problems of our day. My experience as a faculty member here has taught me that while our community is highly adept at discovering the fundamental mechanisms of disease, we have untapped potential for translating these discoveries into novel treatments. It's a small subset of our faculty who've been highly successful in the world of biotech startups. Yet I suspect that far more of our faculty have aspirations of developing novel therapeutics. So we tested this theory. We surveyed the faculty, almost 900 laboratory heads from across the Harvard Life Sciences community, and we gathered some fascinating data. Of faculty on the Harvard Medical School quadrangle and at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, 83% described their work as primarily basic. While at the hospitals, the number was lower at 64%. Importantly, though, despite the fact that such a high percentage of our laboratories are dedicated to basic research, 88% of respondents indicated that their laboratories identified pathways and targets that presented opportunities for therapeutics development. And 70% of those indicated that they had in fact initiated efforts to develop therapeutics, mostly through screening of small molecules, but most of these projects never resulted in new drugs. Instead of being harvested, these projects were left to wither on the vine. Now the limitation was not, as some have suggested, a lack of interest in developing novel disease treatments at Harvard Medical School, far from it. A lack of interest was reported by a mere 7% of respondents. Instead, the major limitations that were cited was a lack of funding for research specifically targeted to therapeutic goals, insufficient infrastructure for therapeutics development, and a lack of sufficient knowledge to drive therapeutics programs or a lack of collaborators with the relevant expertise in therapeutics development. Importantly then, the survey uncovered a hearty appetite for advancing fundamental research towards therapeutic directions, but progress has been thwarted by limitations we can now address. Over the past few months, a task force of our faculty, led by Tim Mitchison uh, and Nathaniel Gray, has been considering how to position Harvard Medical School to become more, uh, more effective at advancing fundamental scientific insights towards therapeutic goals. The task force recommended several innovative new programs and platforms to enable the entire community to more effectively identify therapeutic targets and strategies, formulate small molecules, proteins, antibodies, genes, and cells, and even marshal therapies through clinical proof of concept and regulatory approval. 
So I'm delighted to tell you that we will soon formally launch the Harvard Therapeutics Initiative. It's currently in the fledgling stages, and we're essentially drawing up the blueprints. We're also launching a Harvard-MIT program in regulatory science, which will be headed, spearheaded by Peter Sorger. With a $5 million investment from Massachusetts, support from advisors, including former FDA Commissioner Peggy Hamburg, former Vertex founder and CEO Joshua Boger, and faculty members with major industry experience like Mark Fishman, our goal is to catalyze innovation that will make the development of therapeutics faster, better, and cheaper. First and foremost, our scientific vision for advancing therapeutics at Harvard Medical School will be predicated on deep investments in fundamental quad science and on core technology platforms that will convene the broader community. Our strategy will involve nurturing and empowering the exceptional talent of faculty, trainees, and students by providing greater resources and rewards for collaborative research and greater investments in enabling technologies that will bring scientists together to solve common problems. Given that virtually all of our scientists are under-resourced relative to their potential because of the flat or maybe even decreasing buying power of the NIH, we will be investing considerable institutional funds to accelerate and enhance the exciting research that is being conducted here on the Quad and around our life sciences community. I've just announced the first installment of the innovation grants in the basic and social sciences at HMS. This first cycle will award some $4 million in grants to support collaborative research at Harvard Medical School. And every six months for the next several years, we will fund another cycle of grants until we've invested $50 million to ensure that Harvard Medical School remains at the cutting edge. If you didn't apply this round, I urge you to get in line and apply for the next round. Second, we plan to invest in improving the infrastructure for research that advances insight into mechanism, which is, after all, the fundamental foundation for therapeutics development. We are going to invest at least $50 million over the next several years to augment core technology platforms and seed new ones and make these available to scientists across our community. These will include augmenting platforms for chemical screening, imaging, single cell sequencing, proteomics, and adding bold new competencies in biomedical computer vision, neuroinstrumentation, human immunology, and clinical genome analysis platform. Third, and absolutely essential to advancing the mission of Harvard Medical School, we have the extraordinary opportunity to transform therapeutics education and execution by building bridges between the Harvard Life Sciences community and our neighbors in biopharma. We will launch a bold program that partners faculty, students, trainees, and experts from industry and finance in ideation sessions, seminars, workshops, and formal coursework. And what we are provisionally calling the iHub, the I stands for ideation or innovation, we're, we're working on that. The goal is not only to share knowledge that's currently state of the art, but more importantly, to generate novel ideas and approaches to therapeutics development and innovative new strategies that are not currently being practiced in industry. We'll be providing more detail in the coming months as we roll out the Therapeutic and Regulatory Sciences Initiative. I envision that the Harvard Medical School of the future will assert its rightful place as the epicenter of Boston's dynamic community of biomedical discovery and translation. This effort will be in tandem with the exceptional work already taking place within Harvard Catalyst, our clinical translational science program, which this year, I'm happy to report, received an exceptional score and has been refunded through 2023. To position Harvard Medical School for the future, we need to revitalize our campus infrastructure. So despite 
very tight economic times, we are earmarking $300 million over the next 10 years to modernize the HMS Quadrangle. Now, if you've been in, in TMEC recently, you've seen the great work that's gone into renovations in the atrium outside the, the Carl Walter Amphitheater. All of the academic societies now have really wonderful new uh, headquarters that make a much more efficient use of the space. And by spring, our students will have new study and meeting areas on that same floor, a space where medical students and graduate students will be able to co-mingle. And I, I thank um, the program of medical education and the other folks who really made all this possible. So let me speak a bit about progress in medical and graduate education. I could not be more pleased at the tremendous success of the new medical school curriculum uh, called, inventively, Pathways. <laughs> I inherited it. Um, let me give you one example, though, that relates to student engagement. So recent data from the AAMC survey of all US medical schools showed that about 50% of students actually attend classes in the pre clinical curriculum, 50% of students. And it's the same at Harvard Medical School. But when we piloted the case-based collaborative learning at HMS, that number jumped to 70%. And the first cohort in our pathway curriculum reported 97% attendance in class, which is truly remarkable. Would somebody please wake up the other 3%, get them to show up? <laughs> Um, the first cohort of the Pathways students also uh, just came in with the highest board scores HMS has ever recorded. So the curriculum's working. Another innovative aspect of our new curriculum are the advanced integrated science courses where quad-based faculty pair with clinical faculty from the hospitals in a novel educational partnership. These courses are getting the best reviews that we've ever seen. So this is all very encouraging because we're now in the midst of self-study as part of the reaccreditation process through the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, so-called LCME. Reaccreditation of our medical school occurs once every eight years, and believe me, we have to take this very seriously. We expect that this period of self-study, self-reflection will make us stronger. The goal is to really help us integrate into our DNA the continuous quality improvement philosophy that the LCME expects. We want every part of the school to take ownership of its own collection and analysis of data so that HMS reaches higher levels of improvement and excellence. Now, LCME accreditation has become an increasingly rigorous process but we're well on our way to establishing the systems that will help us harness the advantages of our size and scale, which can at times be a liability, while also ensuring that we're able to monitor all of our faculty processes and student outcomes. Regarding graduate education, the program in graduate education and the standing committee on the governance and oversight of the master's degrees have collaborated for the past 10 months on the first ever comprehensive review of graduate education at Harvard Medical School. The effort has involved more than 100 program heads, faculty, staff, students, and that process is formulating important recommendations right now regarding all aspects of our nine PhD programs, six master's programs. A critical priority in education for me is expanding the training of physician scientists. I've announced a plan to double the size of our MD, PhD program and to invest heavily in the Harvard, MIT, Health Sciences and Technology MD curriculum. We must do this. We have to do this to continue to attract the most ambitious and creative students who work at the intersection of discovery and clinical practice and who will become the future leaders of translational medicine. We have already been successful in raising philanthropic funds to increase the number of accepted MD-PhD students from 12 to 14 for next fall's class. And additional funds have been raised to support two students in cycle two as well. 
The first ever external advisory board meeting was held this past year to review our HST program with recommendations to follow as we all approach and anticipate HST's 50th anniversary celebration in 2020. Uh, I also note that I'm looking forward to Irving London's 100th birthday celebration coming up. And I look forward to updating you on the progress in HST in the future. We're also educating students way beyond the real estate of the quadrangle and our affiliates with innovative online learning platforms, continuing education for physicians, global education courses, programs customized, for executives at companies like Google and Athena, and exciting programs for the public who just want to improve their health and well-being. We're inviting people from throughout the world to learn from Harvard medical expertise. And we invite you, members of our faculty, to learn more about who, how you can partner with us in what is really a very exciting educational enterprise. And we are continuing to embrace our responsibility to offer the most compassionate care to patients around the globe. With the leadership of Paul Farmer, we're committed to raising endowment funds to support the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine to ensure that Paul's remarkable humanitarian spirit can live on. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to address our challenges. Importantly, we must address the recurring financial deficit that has plagued the school ever since the financial collapse of 10 years ago. To that end, we've worked to craft a four-pronged plan to achieve financial sustainability. First, we've received substantial financial support from the university. We have forged a new level of cooperation and collaboration with the university and for that, I am deeply grateful. I look forward to working with our next president, Larry Bacow. Larry will be succeeding Drew Faust this summer. Some of you will know that as a member of the Harvard Corporation, Larry has actually been assigned to me. So he's been my mentor for the past year. So I know him very well. I can say with great confidence that he understands Harvard Medical School, he understands our challenges, and he will support strong investments in the life sciences. Even so, the university's commitment does not come without expectations that we will make meaningful financial improvements to bring our expenses in line with our revenues. To achieve expense reductions, we're reducing our overall workforce slightly through attrition and subsequent position control rather than through layoffs. And we are renegotiating maintenance and service agreements to achieve savings. Second, we are excited by the prospect of increasing revenues through a variety of sources, including the sale of the Harvard Institutes of Medicine building at Four Black Fan Circle, which my administrative team put forth as an alternative, if you remember, to the sale of our most important asset, the new research building. The initial bids for Four Black Fan Circle are in, and we expect to close a very healthy sale by the summer. And this sale will provide ample cash to pay off longstanding debt and enable us to avoid tapping into precious endowment income to cover our deficits for this year and next. For, now, for those of you who are currently working in HIM, don't worry. Our current offices and laboratories will remain as we will continue to lease space from the new owners. And in another revenue-generating effort, our popular master's programs in biomedical informatics and another, a new master's, which we will launch with external education in patient safety and quality improvement, are revenue-generating, and they are closely aligned with our educational mission. Third, we continue to depend upon and benefit from the financial support from the hospital affiliates. They continue to invest in Harvard Medical School, and as dean, I'm grateful for the privileged relationship that HMS has with so many remarkable institutions of clinical excellence and innovation. It's only because we work together that we're able to achieve so much in teaching, research, and patient care. And fourth and finally, We've been aggressively pursuing philanthropic support. 
You have heard me say before, and I will say again now, that fundraising is a top priority for me. Considerable effort on my part is needed, I know that, to ensure that you all will have the resources to innovate, pursue breakthrough science, and that we all collectively have the resources to provide scholarships and stipends to ensure that the most promising students come to Harvard Medical School regardless of their financial means. In the last two months, we've raised additional funds to support student fellowships and financial aid. During my fundraising visits around the country, one benefactor came forward to support financial aid because his father had begun medical school hoping to become a doctor, but had to drop out because he could not afford to finish. And this generous donor was driven to provide our students with the opportunity that his father was denied. Our most recent fund drive, The World is Waiting, the campaign for Harvard Medicine, which was launched in 2014, has recently surpassed its goal of $750 million way ahead of schedule. The campaign has advanced our priorities of education, discovery, service, and leadership, and will continue until June 30th, 2018. I am cautiously optimistic that we will receive additional major gifts before the end of this campaign. The Harvard Medical School campaign is part of the broader campaign. We're actually the third largest goal across all of the university's 12 schools. We've been supported and are enormously grateful to the nearly 10,000 individuals who've embraced our mission and who are investing in the life-saving work of our school. I want to call out Lisa Boudreau, who's our Dean for Alumni Affairs and Development for her outstanding leadership in this effort. Thank you, Lisa. So though the campaign may soon end, my commitment to fundraising will not. Uh, philanthropy is vital to our shared progress, to the future of Harvard Medicine, uh, and vital to the vision that I've outlined uh, for today. Now, before I conclude, I, I want to point out that uh, we as a school have also raised our voices in advocacy around issues that affect our core mission. We've spoken out against bigoted anti-immigration policies. We've stood in solidarity with our four DACA students, and we look forward to helping to secure their freedom to contribute to American medicine and science. And last March, we all came together to advocate for science here on the Quadrangle and on the Boston Common in the March for Science. I'm proud of the efforts of this community, which is united to speak in one voice on these important issues. And finally, let me reflect on my own performance over the past year. I started as dean last January after a long career as a scientist and a director of a small clinical service at Boston Children's Dana-Farber. In becoming dean, I faced a multitude of new challenges and completely novel predicaments for which I was completely unprepared. I have made a lot of mistakes in this past year. Many, many rookie mistakes. For those mistakes and for those I have harmed, I am deeply sorry. I can only say that I'm learning. I'm learning from my mistakes, and I hope that that learning will make me more effective in the coming years and beyond. I've learned this past year that my most precious commodity is time. I've spent an enormous chunk of my time focused on fundraising, often traveling outside Harvard Medical School to find ways to strengthen the school. In addition, you may know that when I became dean, I made a decision to continue leading my lab, though on a much reduced framework and at some considerable personal sacrifice, I am devoting one day a week. And periodically, I'm asked why I chose to do this, given the demands of being dean. Now, while Harvard Medical School has a multifaceted mission of advancing education, research, and patient care, my role as dean 
at its core is being a steward of our research and educational missions. I believe it's intrinsic to my credibility as a leader of this school that I continue to be a practicing scholar, teacher, and scientist. I believe that my continued engagement as a faculty member enhances my ability to serve the school as dean. However, please know, I will continue to learn throughout my tenure, including critically examining how I devote my time to various priorities as dean, and be assured that my first commitment unwaveringly is to the vitality of this institution. I've covered a great deal uh, of ground this afternoon. It's late in the day. I hope you come away from here understanding that I take tremendous pride in what each and every one of you bring to this community. You are why Harvard Medical School is the greatest biomedical community on earth, second to none, and why our future is so bright. And as I discovered that night many years ago on the wards at MGH, and has proven to me every day when I arrive here on the quad, we at Harvard Medical School are better together. I am very confident and optimistic about our future. I thank you for coming this afternoon. I believe we do have a few minutes where I'd like to hear some of your thoughts and your questions. And please know that we're going to have a Green Dragon pub following the period for questions. Thank you for your attention.